everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today uh, on the webinar. And uh, we think this is, as Bryce said, a very uh, timely and important topic. And we're pleased to have uh, three of the leading experts in this field uh, with us today. Uh, Brad Lilliquist is uh, Technical Director of Net Zero Energy Buildings at the International Living Future Institute. Alex Steffen is Planetary Futurist in Residence at IDEO and uh, edited the book that uh, I hope some of you have read, uh, I certainly did, called World Changing, A User's Guide for the 21st Century. And Jonathan Rowe, the Sustainability Solutions Program Manager of Autodesk. I'm Clint Wilder, Senior Editor at Clean Edge. So uh, we can start the slides, Bryce. Uh, and Bryce went through this. Uh, <clears throat> I'll set the stage uh, with a little bit of background on the topic and um, then uh, kind of introduce each panelist by way of a question. Uh, and then uh, for uh, about 20 to uh, 30 minutes, we'll have a moderated conversation with the three panelists, followed by your questions. So as, as Bryce indicated, please type those in the chat box and we will uh, field them. And <clears throat> we uh, very much want to thank our sponsor uh, for this session and uh, for several events we've done in the Clean Tech Nation briefing series, Autodesk. Um, we we'll want to thank Autodesk for sponsoring and also for the really great work they're doing uh, to enable clean tech solutions around the world. And they have a very interesting uh, program called the Design-Led Design Revolution, uh, which um, you can read more about on the website, autodesk.com slash cleantech. So let's uh, dive right in here. And as the, as the title of the webinar implies, in just a few years, net zero has really grown from a kind of a wouldn't it be great kind of concept to actual reality in a growing number of projects around the world. Um, I want to start with uh, one of the definitions um, and we'll, we'll get into this in the discussion. Uh, and defining, if you can move to the next slide, Bryce. So this is the definition of a, a zero net energy building from the living building challenge, uh, which is a building that generates as much energy or more than it uses over the course of a year. Uh, it's it sounds like a very simple concept, but obviously very challenging to achieve that. And uh, just to kind of give a little sense of, of the growth of uh, net zero or zero net energy, and we'll use those terms interchangeably uh, today. Um, this is from the New Buildings Institute, which has a, a different definition. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that in a little bit. But just to give a sense of the growth here, um, just over uh, uh, the past couple of years. These are from the spring of 2012 and 2014. And uh, when you add up the, the verified buildings and districts, the emerging buildings and districts for zero net energy, and also ultra low energy buildings, um, it's about uh, it's more than double the growth uh, between 2012 and 2014. Next slide. And a little sense of the geographic distribution of, of these zero net energy projects. Uh, the numbers um, in, the, in the circles are for verified buildings only. <clears throat> and so not surprisingly, the largest number is in California with 10 and you can see uh, Washington and Oregon with two each, New York as well. Uh, you know, places that you kind of expect uh, being more very green-minded and leaders in uh, clean energy deployment. But there are some uh, surprises on here, too, uh, in places like Florida, Kentucky, Indiana. Um, Indiana's zero net energy building is a library, and the two buildings in Kentucky are actually school buildings. So let's uh, get the conversation going. And I want to start with, with you, Brad. Uh, so back in 2006, um, 
the Cascadia Green Building Council, which is now part of International Future Living, Living Future Institute, launched the Living Building Challenge, uh, creating a formal goal for worldwide architects and designers to create these net zero structures. Um, so you were you kind of uh, go back to, to this time and, and, and further back. Um, talk a little bit about uh, coming to that uh, definition and also the, the progress you've seen in net zero buildings uh, since, since the challenge was launched. Sorry, Brad, are you with us? I'm sorry, I had you on mute as I was okay. not supposed to do, so my apologies. Um, I thought the line sounded sort of dead. So welcome everybody, I'm, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, this, um, so let me take the question in two pieces um, and really address the definition piece and then talk about progress. Um, regarding the definition, and I, I, I have an overall blanket thing that I'd like to sort of say first is, I think this is one of, to me, net zero energy is an incredibly exciting um, concept that um, really, I think, sparks the imagination of people, your average person. It's one of these places where uh, deep energy efficiency and renewables meets popular, cu popular culture. And um, I, I do have a, a general message I want to broadcast to all the technicians, because <laughs> I you know, there's a tendency of like, okay, let's immediately take this great idea and immediately try to systematize it and dissect it and um, in some cases uh, kill it uh, or take the fun out of it. And I think my my most overarching comment would be, uh, you know, I think there is a, a pretty uniform core agreement amongst everybody um, working on net zero energy that that really kind of a starting point of a definition is a building that generates as much energy as it uses over the course of a year. And, you know, whether you, um, you know, and we would add to that that you, it actually needs to be certified and actually, you know, that that is, you know, you're looking at the performance with a third party group that's actually certifying that, that the performance is actually there. But, um, Setting that aside, people will get into, you know, is it zero net energy or net zero energy or, you know, et cetera. Um, those things to me are not that important. What's important is we actually have found something that excites a broad range of people around transforming uh, the market for deep, you know, a radical transformation of the built environment to be uh, carbon neutral. So. Um, I'm kind of giving a non-definition as my first response. Um, I will say that the Institute, based on that initial definition I'm giving, has, I would say, two kind of core um, additional things, or actually, actually I'd say three additional things, one of which I already mentioned. I think, um, the, I will say that the net zero energy space has had, uh, to grab a marketing term, the brand promise has been uh, diluted by a lot of practitioners who love to grab the term net zero energy because they realize how powerful it is, apply it to their project, and then either not even ever really intend for it to achieve that core definition, or maybe they kind of design it to achieve it and kind of lose sight of that at some point, or they never bother to see if the building actually performed at that level or have a third party certification. So, and I can tell you, I interact with, you know, and I will say I actually think the list is bigger than, than the one you were sharing earlier. If you look at just living building registrations, we have 225 worldwide and, you know, the majority of those are pursuing net zero energy. But, you know, regardless of the number, I think that, um, that that third party uh, certification is, is really important. Um, a couple of other pieces that I would add that we add is we actually have a prohibition on combustion uh, in the building and um, that's a bit uh, different than, than most other definitions. My feeling is, is that the majority of buildings out there and, and probably the optimized technological pathway doesn't include combustion 
anyway, and I'm talking about like natural gas, like a natural gas boiler or something like that. Uh, it's not that's not the most efficient efficient way to net zero energy, um, and so um, uh, that uh, that is another limitation. And I can go into describing the reasons for that uh, in a bit. Okay. Uh, sh um, should I go go ahead? Uh, let's uh, actually let's move over to Alex. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And because uh, we we'll want to get your sense, and, and this picks up on something that you said, Brad, about you found something that excites people, um, and so, uh, Alex, what's, why, why you've written a, a book uh, recently called Carbon Zero? Um, you know, net zero green design has been around for a while, but uh, give us your elevator pitch about uh, why why net zero is so important. Well, so I think there's two reasons. I think there's the sort of meta reason, um, which is that we live on a planet of limits, and we're pressing up hard against those limits and in all sorts of ways, but most especially in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, we know that within the lifetimes, within the working lifetimes of a lot of people who are, who are currently in the field, uh, we are going to need to uh, essentially reach zero emissions um, if we are going to stay consonant with a, a livable planet. Um, it's something we don't talk enough about and about the implications of that. Um, but the science is really unequivocal that if you have a carbon budget, which we've been we have by the IPCC that sooner or later you are going to have to stop spending, right? Um, so there's the larger sort of challenge of how do we restructure our systems um, uh, all across the board to produce zero emissions um, or close to it. Uh, and so in that context, I think net zero uh, is very topical with this sort of larger move towards zero as a concept. Um, there's also, I think, a cultural thing happening where people are really interested in trying to start with the things that they have control over now or that they have influence over now and make those, you know, make those sort of guilt free if possible, right? Um, so, uh, for example, um, a, uh, a building that some folks may know, I, I noticed you had a slide, it was on one of the slides, um, is the, uh, the Bullet Center up in Seattle. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that one of the real drivers there was the Bullet Foundation, which is the owner and one of the inhabitants of that building, um, is primarily an environmental foundation. And I think they realized that they, they could use their operating budget to achieve something that would both be, you know, a beacon of progress, but also that would make their own operations consonant with their own values. And I think there are a lot of people who are trying to live into that idea, um, you know, in business and in politics and in uh, just sort of community life, uh, who, who are eager to figure out a way to not be adding to the problem in their own work, whatever else they're doing. Um, right. yeah. So I think both of those are, are very, you know, I think both of those lend energy to the situation. Um, and just, I would add, uh, we'll probably get into this later, but another very prominent example is the Packard Foundation in mm -hmm. California, uh, their headquarters. So, you know, perhaps yeah. some of this, I think. yeah. Yeah, and I think there's, you know, the Bullet Center actually raises a really interesting challenge. And I, I you know, I had the privilege of giving some, some early <laughs> feedback on that project. And, um, one of the real questions with when talking about net zero or zero net energy is this question of the location of the energy production, right? Nobody has yet designed a building that doesn't need any energy. Um, so it's, we're going to have energy production somewhere. And I think the real question that's been getting kicked around a lot is should that energy be generated on site? Um, I think in, there are some contexts where there's, really no question, right? If you're in a suburban context where there's sort of no barrier to the amount of uh, generation you can do on site, uh, then great. Uh, but in many urban contexts, there's a trade-off between uh, the, between basic questions like floor area ratio and kinds of program that you can include in a building and your ability to generate that energy on site. There's also other questions about things like solar rights and the extent to which that limits development around a building. 
Um, and because uh, we know that transportation emissions, especially in the U.S., are one of the largest, if not the largest, source of emissions, um, depending on how you want to slice the pie, um, having areas which are both compact with a fair amount of density and walkable is a very, very high priority um, uh, emissions reduction strategy. And, and that's something that I look a lot at in Carbon Zero, the book that I wrote about cities and carbon neutrality. Um, and so I think there's one question that's worth sort of exploring is this question of do you need to really generate energy on site? Um, a second question that, and, and I understand that for some definitions you absolutely do, right? Um, uh, but the, I think there's a larger question in the field of is that a necessary strategy? Um, there's the, uh, another question is about what the priority should be for getting there. And I, you know, I've certainly um, encountered some people who think of uh, net zero at least casually without having been engaged with it too much as just a matter of adding clean energy production to an otherwise fairly conventional building, right? And that's clearly not the, the necessarily the best strategy or the preferred goal. And I think it's worth talking about using demand reduction and how key that is becoming um, to the field of, of green building in general, but also specifically to this question of how do we create buildings, neighborhoods, and cities that can provide their energy within a, you know, a more limited clean energy budget, right? Um, and on that front, I think things like passive house are really interesting to look at and talk about. And then I think the last thing that is uh, in sort of the larger context that's, that's coming up is I think one of the things that I hear a lot from architects and engineers when, when they're talking about green building and about net zero stuff is this larger question of the inhabitants relationship to energy use and the sort of behavioral and cultural changes that need to happen to actually run your building the way that it can most effectively, uh, you know, reduce its energy demand. And that there are, there's some of that thinking, I think, is beginning to spill over into larger questions of things like program within a building. And can you more effectively use the spaces within a building? Um, can, can we actually start to think about uh, you know, dematerializing the need for some space by sharing space more effectively. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have been very inspired by, for example, Uber and other sort of car sharing and, and ride uh, brokering programs and how effective they've been at reducing the need for cars in dense areas. And I think there's right. some of that. I'm, I'm hearing some of that discussion about can we think that way in terms of building. So those are three things that I, that I see happening. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's a very good segue over to Jonathan because, Alex, you bring up a lot of issues that are questions about design. So uh, let's get into a little bit of uh, where, where Autodesk sees this, this all going and, and what, what, Jonathan, what's Autodesk uh, doing to, to support Net Zero and, and what, what are some of the, your best specific examples that uh, you guys have worked on? Sure. Thanks, Clint. Um, Autodesk is a company uh, we're very much aware of and concerned by the epic challenges that our world faces with things like climate change uh, and certainly working hard to show leadership in response to those challenges. Uh, as a design software company with the mission to help uh, people imagine and design and create a better world, we see sustainability as a critical element to get right there. So that applies to our own business, but more importantly for the customers using the software and simulation services that we create uh, to design the future of the world that we're all going to be living in. And as a company, we strongly believe that good design can help lead to a world where future generations are living well and living within the limits of our planet. And more and more, these net zero building projects are popping up across the U.S., across the globe, uh, and demonstrating a revolution in the kind of thinking about how good building design can reduce energy demand and in some cases even lead to buildings that produce more than they consume. So to support this growing movement, these trends, uh, Autodesk is investing in educational resources for students and professionals to understand high-performance design strategies for both buildings and products. 
The Autodesk Building Performance Analysis Certificate Program is a series of free online learning resources that teach important net zero design strategies like daylighting simulation, setting and orientation for passive design strategies, uh, and whole building energy simulation. And along with these educational resources, we also create 3D building information modeling software that integrates tools that help with these kinds of really important sustainability studies. And our hope is that by putting these tools and educational resources uh, close into the hands of our customers, that they'll be able to make better and more informed decisions that are built on high quality simulations instead of just relying on prescriptive approaches or tradition or rules of thumb. Uh, so that with technology they can actually model the impacts of their design decisions, explore lots of solutions before committing to one, and, and really collaborate more openly as a multidisciplinary team. Uh, because this kind of performance-based approach uh, you'll see is a pretty central theme to net zero design. And it's one that Autodesk as a company is working hard to make easier with, uh, with the help of technology where possible. Uh, in terms of good examples I've seen lately, uh, both of the ones that are top of mind for me have already been uh, talked about a little bit. Um, I think we're going to see some pictures, uh, some images to, to uh, accompany this later on in the webinar, but the Packard Foundation in uh, headquarters in Los, Los Altos, California is a really great example of a net zero, and I believe the largest one yet to pass through the Living Future Institute certification program, if I recall. Um, and the other one that's been getting a lot of attention and has already been mentioned is the Bullet Center in Seattle. Uh, it's got a goal in that zero, zero, which I believe it's on track to achieve, but it's still measuring its performance since it's a pretty new building. Um, and that project is also going for full living building certification, which means it's doing some pretty amazing things environmentally beyond just net zero energy, like going for net zero water, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, and I think more importantly, both of these projects stand out for me for their exceptional performance goals, absolutely. But along with having their low environmental footprints, they're also just extremely beautiful and inviting to the people who get to work there or walk by them on the street every day. And I think that's a really important thing to, to layer in discussion. If we're talking about getting the future right and solving epic challenges with net zero design, you know, things like efficiency and renewal are super important. But you know, first and foremost, you have to create something that's lasting, something that's going to stand the test of time and still be there maybe in a hundred years instead of being uh, torn down and back into the waste stream like a lot of buildings uh, on the map today. Yeah, very good point. Another, uh, another way to think about sustainability is you want the building that lasts, for sure. Um, I want to turn to the uh, technology uh, uh, clean, clean tech solutions for, for a moment. Uh, Brad, what, what technical advancements um, have been the most influential in, in making uh, net zero happen and grow? Uh, and what do you see, and, and what, what's missing? What, what needs to happen, say, in the next three to five years to, to really push things forward? Yeah. Um you know, I think that there's been three key advancements in the last five years um, that have really come together to make uh, net zero energy buildings extremely feasible. And I think, I mean, part of me, you know, right now I just feel like, hey, gang, you know, these things are, you know, they were, they were in the last five years, the math has changed a lot on them. And I think we're really going to see an explosion as people uh, turn on to that reality, and I'd say it's in three areas. It's in the area of heat pump technology uh, and the rapid increase in adoption of heat pumps as really the primary heating and cooling systems of buildings. I think the second is is um, envelope uh, envelope uh, advancements. Uh, sorry, I think. sorry, Brad. By, by heat pump, you mean the the uh, like the geothermal uh, ground source? Well, that's one type. Um, you know, a, a geothermal would be, a, it's like a pre-warming loop that then goes into a heat pump. But the, you know, the core of a heat pump is basically a compressor-based heating or cooling system that uses the ideal gas law notion that when you compress something in a gaseous state, it, it heats up. And when you let it decompress, it cools down. And so the the beauty of what a heat pump does is it basically for every single unit of energy compression energy you put into it you get about three units of heating or cooling out of it um, and if you're really fancy and some people are doing this 
you can capture both the heating and the cooling at the same time, and that's when you get really exponentially high levels of performance. Um, and we're seeing people do that at this point also. So, you know, if you think about something like a resistance heater or a gas boiler, you know, people are kind of trying to take those and make them as efficient as possible, but at a certain point, they just uh, go up against the limit of, you know, one basically is their level of efficiency, whereas there's this multiplier effect uh, with a heat pump. Um, and just real quickly, the other two, um, you know, advancements in, in envelope technology, I think, are also really critical. Um, you know, there's some low-hanging fruit. I mean, to me, like triple-pane windows technologically are not that complicated to build uh, or make. It's just more that they're a custom item at this point. Um, you know, we're seeing some states where uh, performance testing or blower door testing of both residential and commercial buildings is becoming code. Um, so, you know, really, you know, if you think about building structural systems, we're building buildings like they're Model Ts. You know, I mean, you, you have a two by four wall section, you throw some insulation in it and, you know, close it up and call it good. You know, I, not sure that's necessarily the best approach if you're really trying to take uh, climate change and, um, you know, seriously. And then the third thing is renewable technology and the radical reduction in prices of renewables. And, I mean, those costs are, you know, have come down by more than 50% in the last five years. And so those three things, and there's obviously other things at play there, but they're really coming together to um, really change the marketplace. And I mean, in terms of what I would say to me, what the most important things are to accelerate that is actually, I mean, there are a lot of really, um, I would say, I'd say two things. One is, you know, the quicker we can make all three of those things more mainstream as, as far as, you know, moving the HVAC community over from regulation and best practices over to heat pump based systems that's going to have a radical impact um, same with envelopes same with with renewables and then I think as far as the direction of new technology I think you know if you really think about net zero energy from the standpoint of end game like what are you know going back to what Alex was talking about which I thought was really interesting you know what are we trying what's the what's the ball we're trying to hit here the ball we're trying to hit here is um, you know saving ourselves from climate change and ocean acidification and not having to spend trillions of dollars on defending energy supplies I mean those are you know big picture the two biggies um, you know, if we're going to go to a place where we're going to really be able to be 100% renewable based, we do have to address energy storage. And so I think that's, um, you know, tons of stuff's going on with that, with battery technology, but there's old school solutions like even mechanical storage, hydraulic storage on a community level that I think are some really interesting directions that we're going to see taken in the next uh, five to ten years. And, in fact, energy storage was the subject of our last webinar. Um, Alex, let's move into the, the well, this is all nice, but it, it just costs too much uh, argument and, and how to, to counter that. Uh, you know, can we, can we show uh, good payback periods for net zero? Uh, you know, how, how do we make a, a good business case? Well, so, I mean, I think like we were just talking about, uh, the business case itself is changing very rapidly. But I think um, already we have some pretty good evidence that uh, especially over, you know, over sort of that five to seven year range, um, a lot of these things start to, you know, pay back pretty well. Um, I mean, one of the big things that I think we don't talk about enough here in the U.S., but folks in Europe talk a lot about is the extent to which you know, you can actually uh, spend a lot less money on your HVAC system if you have a well-designed, well-ventilated, extremely efficient building, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Passive House is a much bigger standard over there. Um, uh, you know, there are thousands of buildings that are Passive House buildings in Europe. Um, and basically that concept is just airtight envelope, 
with good insulation, uh, heat exchanger fans, um, you know, and uh, and some good attention to things like siting of the building for solar gain and those kinds of things. And the point that those people make all the time, um, the sort of European passive house people make, is that you're actually able to save money both upfront and on operations. Um, I think that there's also a, increasingly, at least for, for companies that are looking into a little bit of a longer term, I think there's also some uh, very direct uh, benefits to be captured in terms of being simply more resist, resilient to energy price shocks, right? That, um, you know, we know energy is a wildly fluctuating field right now. And, um, you know, there's lots of reasons to expect that we will see carbon pricing, um, not just internationally, but I, I actually think that it's closer than a lot of people think here in the U.S. Um, and that, you know, those folks who are tied into both energy wasteful, you know, products, systems, buildings, and especially to energy wasteful and fossil fuel um, driven systems are, are simply at more financial risk, right? I mean, we're even seeing, for example, oil companies starting to look at their own operations and markets in terms of what carbon pricing would do to those, to their systems, um, you know, to their operations as a business. So I think that there's, um, you know, I would I would defer to both these guys in terms of what the specific payoffs are for for various systems, but I think that um, that for folks who have a longer term interest in the building, it's pretty clear that those payoffs work. Um, the the thing that I hear people talking about is is the difficulty of building this stuff into sort of you know, into the business model of developers who are looking to offload the building once it's complete, um, and how how it can be a difficult thing for those guys to see this penciling out in terms of of market price um, for those structures. But I even think that may be changing because I think, like was alluded to earlier, the concept of net zero is becoming really popular. Right, the concept of of, of, of detaching yourself from bad systems is is becoming popular, and I think there's some brand value to that, to you know, uh, to businesses that would be buying those buildings. So anyway, I would defer to these guys about the specifics of different systems and how close we are to, you know, to how, how long it takes for those to pay off and how close we are to improvements in those. Yeah, um, Alex, I think you made some really good points there. This is Jonathan. Just a couple of uh, things to build on on that discussion. Um, you know, in terms of payback periods, I haven't seen a lot of really great examples of the pro forma thinking out on a short-term basis for a for developer, but there has been a case study uh, sort of on the conference circuit over the past six months, eight months or so, uh, about the case study from the uh, uh, the company Sharp Development. Uh, they did a project uh, office renovation in Northern California uh, where they did exactly the things that you're, you're talking about. Uh, by right-sizing their systems, uh, their low-energy systems, uh, instead of relying on rules of thumb or, or things of that nature, they were able to really downsize their mechanical equipment that leads to a lot of uh, ongoing cost savings throughout the life of the building. Um, they leased up the, the, the place a lot sooner than, than uh, traditionally uh, with other kinds of buildings, and they uh, got a little bit of a rent premium on it. And they're basically voicing that their pro forma inks out to it, you know, not really having that that long payback period that many expect there to be. Uh, so I think you're probably going to see even more of that in the coming years as, uh, as developers kind of change their mindset to be a little bit more expansive in terms of how they uh, look at their pro forma. And the other thing that I would layer onto that in terms of you know too costly up front, too long a payback period, you know, how to attack that argument is shifting the discussion away from just cost and talking about the value of the, the building that you're, that you're creating for per perpetuity um, and beginning to look more broadly at the value of eco ecosystem services and other externalities that are often not really part of the discussion. And if that becomes more central to the discussion, I think uh, it'll be a little bit easier to, to attack that, uh, that argument. But you know, what is the cost to society of those greenhouse gas emission savings uh, that are the result of going for a net zero design? Uh, that's that's something really important to uh, to layer in the discussion as well. 
And, and maybe this is Brad, maybe just a uh, quick response on the cost thing because that's something I know well. Um, so prior to joining the Institute, I actually developed a net zero energy um, community called Z Home uh, here in the Seattle area. And um, it's interesting, you know, when we did the initial pro forma on that project, we assumed that uh, to achieve net zero energy, this is for market rate townhomes, that they would cost and we would be able to sell with a 20% price premium. That is what it cost, and that and we did uh, we were able to sell it at a 20% price premium. I would say today that would be about half that, uh, maybe 10 to 12%. Um, and so that says a lot about how quickly things are changing in terms of costs. And then the other thing I want to I do want to say this is uh, maybe a different take on what Jonathan was saying is. I think looking at total cost of ownership is really critical, you know, and especially if you think about the fact that about one third of uh, our building industry is institutional government. Um, folks that are, that, you know, the idea of a payback period is, you know, that's a very particular concept in the business world that's applicable to certain s systems. You know, if you look at something that's bond financed, a better uh, uh, measure is total cost of ownership over the term of the bond. And in those cases where you're looking out at 20 years, uh, net zero buildings win every time easily. So, you know, every city that's looking at building a new city hall should build a net zero energy city hall because your total payment every year will be less uh, if you include the, uh, the deferment of, of utility bills. Great. Okay, I want to uh, turn to audience questions now, and we have uh, a few good ones, and keep, keep them coming. Just uh, type in those question boxes. Um, got a couple that relate to expanding the discussion beyond uh, energy, net zero energy, to uh, water, waste, uh, and, and other resources. And I guess you know, with net zero carbon is, is another important one. Um, and one one uh, questioner wanted to hear more about the Bullet Foundation's uh, on-site waste recycling. Who would like to tackle water? And uh, I'm happy to take that on, given that that's actually, <laughs> this is Brad, this, I actually am sitting in the Bullet Center right now. It's where our offices are. And, oh, no kidding. Um, yeah, and the Bullet Center was actually um, designed to achieve the full living building challenge, which is, you know, that's that's kind of taking the net zero energy level of performance and applying it across seven uh, different topical areas, including water, materials, health, uh, beauty, um, equity, and, um, and place. So, I mean, as far as how the systems work in this building, it's an amazing system, and it, it honestly works quite well. So... Uh, you know, 100% of the rainwater on the building is collected from the roof, um, and that supplies all the building's needs over the course of the year. There's a 50,000-gallon cistern in the basement, um, and uh, and that basically then is run through a filtration system that then provides potable throughout the building. The building also treats all its um, gray water and black water, i.e. the sewage and, and all the drain water, um, and it does that through a, kind of a, a very well thought out system that is kind of a tiered system that, um, you know, things like shower drains, those sorts of things go into a suspended wetland that's built, on, built onto the side of the building. It's quite beautiful. And then the black water, uh, the sewage, then runs into a, a composting system in the basement of this building, uh, you know, and they take the approach that you know, this is, uh, it's, an, it's a modern approach to composting. You know, a lot of people get the heebie-jeebies around that, but if you look at the actual just chemistry of uh, the transformation, uh, you know, over through the aerobic digestion cycle, uh, you basically get really excellent compost at the end of it, and so that's then um, sent into the, um, the King County um, way, uh, composting stream and comes back in the form of a, a product for application in yards and things. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this is a I want to make sure we expand the discussion uh, 
away a little bit from buildings to uh, products and this whole uh, idea of the circular economy, uh, you know, materials that are reused um, as well as, you know, the, the actual manufacturing process uh, working towards, towards uh, net zero. Um, Alex, are you uh, following that area? I, I presume you are. And are there are there uh, real achievements on this yet, or are, the, it's, are we still in the uh, good targets and getting there phase? Well, I think that in terms of actual actual circular economy stuff, we are mostly still in the targeting phase. I think one thing that's important to note is that uh, for most of what we're doing in terms of uh, of production, we're still in the in the stage where there's really obvious and and easily targeted waste in in almost every system, and that just given our capacities and our priorities, usually eliminating the waste is the most important first step before we even get to the question of how do we reuse these materials or or you know how do we close some of these loops. Um, in some cases it's in part through eliminating the waste that you realize that there is a loop to be closed. But, you know, I mean, I, I remember hearing the statistic, I think it's, it's something roughly around 10% of all the products that Americans buy are, are disposed unused. Um, you know, people just never get around to using them at all. Um, certainly I know that there are a huge number of things that folks buy that are very minimally used. I mean, the, the traditional statistic about a power drill, home power drill getting used somewhere between six and 20 minutes in its entire lifetime. Um, but there's also, you know, we know that folks buy uh, computer peripherals they don't really need. We know that folks buy way more car than they need. Um, you know, uh, going to other countries and then coming back to America, you really realize, uh, you know, how over card we are in terms of massive SUVs and, and so forth. Um, there are a lot of very obvious, important, just waste reduction strategies that I think are still a higher priority than closing the back end of the loop. That said, I do think that we're also starting to have a lot more capacity to treat waste as food by, you know, sort of connecting the markets, right? Um, you know, these guys might be able to speak more directly to this, but one of the things that I that I do hear a lot of is folks who realize, oh, you know, in this industrial process, we create this byproduct, which is potentially useful, but not by us. And, you know, how there are various kinds of waste matching systems and so forth uh, that are being created. Um, I think there's this other category of action here that is beginning to happen, which is sort of the 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 concept of design for disassembly, right? Um, and we have definitely seen that with furniture. A number of furniture makers are um, making furniture that can be easily, uh, you know, broken down into constituent parts, and those parts are at least theoretically um, fully recyclable. Um, but I think we're also starting to have some interesting discussions about things like buildings, um, where, you know, the longevity of buildings and their sustainability value was mentioned before, but there's some buildings that it isn't clear that that there's a longevity pitch to make for them. And in those cases, planning for their obsolescence and for the materials that go into them to be reused um, is, I think, a really great second strategy. Um, so it, it, to, to sum up, I think the thing that, that we, we are still mostly in the stage where we're trying to figure out how to eliminate upfront waste. Um, but there is some interesting thinking talking, you know, thinking about the, the back end and how do you loop that around. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another uh, audience question uh, for Brad, um, and this is about the, the no combustion, no natural gas uh, uh, pro prohibition, I guess you have. Um, so the question is, what do you suggest we as a society do to transition the gas utility business model and the existing gas industry infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, that's the million dollar question, um, you know, and it's tough. I mean, we've got, you know, we're all in this society together and we, I think, all have just so much sunk cost in that infrastructure. Um, 
you know, I don't have any ready answers. I just think it's just the reality is, is, you know, our orientation is towards the end game, and we know what the combustion is doing to our atmosphere and to our oceans, and we got to deal with it. And also, the extraction impacts are massive. So, um, you know, I I think, um, you know, my I go back to the question of, or not the question, but the reality of renewables. Um, you know, I mean, wind is operational 24-7 to a degree. I mean, when I say 24-7, it doesn't stop at night. It is potentially a nighttime thing, so you can potentially have that as a generation source. You know, the tough thing with sun is obviously it, it, it only happens during the day. And so I think there's going to be a lot of, I, I think where the conversation is going to start to shift is towards um, you know, as we get more and more solar into the system. And I, you know, if you look at like the most recent cost studies that are coming out, it's a little mind blowing. It's like it's solar is starting to get almost cost competitive and in some cases is com cost competitive to new generation, like certain types of coal and things. Oh, yeah. And so uh, anyway, I mean, it's um, so then to me, the question will shift over time to, well, what are the um, storage strategies? And the thing is, is, you know, it doesn't have to be batteries, even if you look at, you know, how we use, you know, even a house. It's like, well, what happens if you have a net zero house that has a solar array on it? You know, maybe you're running the heating system and the hot water system while the sun is up. And, um, you know, you're almost using the house like a battery. So um, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of thinking is going to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions for Jonathan about uh, Autodesk tools. Do, do you have uh, software that helps comp companies achieve net zero in a retrofit situation? And the second one, are Autodesk tools appropriate for residential scale? Yeah, quick question. It, it, um, so yeah, we do have some uh, some technology that can certainly be applied to uh, things like retrofits. Um, you know, it becomes a matter of creating a building information model that is indeed representative of the existing conditions, which does require some effort on the part of the design team and the user. But if that uh, you know if that is uh, representative of reality, that can be used in a simulation engine like Green Building Studio, which uh, hooks into Revit, which is our building information modeling platform. Uh, so that's something to, uh, to certainly be mindful of, and you can visit our website to find out a little bit more about those sorts of workflows. Uh, and then while our technology is definitely applicable to the residential space, we tend to see some of these simulation services uh, being applied more to the commercial space for right now. Um, it seems though the transition from uh, two-dimensional computer-aided drafting or CAD has been a little bit slower in the residential market compared to the uptake in 3D building information modeling in the commercial sector. Uh, but the simulation engines uh, run the same and can certainly be applied at a residential scale. You could have a house or a, a multifamily unit and model the same sorts of things like daylighting analysis, looking for uh, solar availability to site your renewable generation systems. Uh, you could do shad uh, shading studies to get a sense of uh, what sort of solar resources you had on the site. There's nothing that necessarily prevents users on a residential scale from uh, doing those sorts of simulations. It's just uh, the uptake of that technology has seemed to be a little bit slower on that side of things. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about net zero districts. Uh, I know I've, I've written about the, uh, the one in uh, uh, Davis, California. Um, uh, what, what are some other good examples, uh, and, and how do you, how, you know, how do you go about achieving net zero as a community or campus? So I'm, I'm, this is Brad. I'm happy to jump in on that because it's actually a really timely question because we have just actually launched the Living Community Challenge and uh, based on the Living Building Challenge, and we're basically looking at that exact question on a district scale and um, we have uh, about a dozen projects right now that are at some stage of, of starting to look at that and I don't think 
you know, the jury is out uh, on terms of, you know, how how uh, people will actually achieve it. But uh, it's a fascinating question. Um, you know, District of Columbia is doing quite a bit. Um, the District of Columbia actually did a, a net zero energy uh, study for their downtown area um, that uh, we did with the, in conjunction with the New Buildings Institute. Um, you know, looking at some of those things that Alex was talking about, which is, you know, at a certain point, the idea of net zero energy, if you're going to be really dogmatic about it, starts to become counterproductive. And we, you know, because, because you, you know, you, you just can't produce enough at the higher densities. And, um, you know, without getting too down in the weeds about that, I think we're recognizing that that uh, you have to look at some other strategies. Um, but those strategies are out there. You know, I mean, you. Uh, one of the things that we were just doing, and we were we've been doing some work for San Francisco, and we were doing some footprint analysis, net zero energy footprint analysis, on a neighborhood scale, in Noe Valley there. And it's interesting because what we found is that your typical San Francisco neighborhood. Is can pretty it's pretty easy to achieve net positive energy in that scenario if you you know did deep retrofits and solar in the whole neighborhood, and then you know if you start to look at it from a uh, citywide strategy, you know there may be opportunities where it's like okay you have the neighborhoods basically um, you know in net positive mode and maybe the more intensive areas like downtown are in net negative. Uh, you know, but I think you also may see some some scenarios, you know, where, yeah, a municipality actually says, well, we're also going to have our so our country farm out in the, you know, on the edge of town, and we're going to have you know a couple square miles of solar and some ag and you know all sorts of stuff that, in sort of a synergistic way, um, you know, as a city state. Um, so anyway, I it, it's a that's a brand new area, I would say. Mm -hmm. I think good. there's some. Sorry, uh, oh, I think this is Alex. I, I think there's a there's there's some interesting questioning and, and debate going on within this particular uh, question, of sort of neighborhood or community level and city level. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, that is once you get beyond the performance of the building itself and you start to footprint residents' total energy use, not just their electrical use, um, you immediately, especially uh, in uh, newer parts of America, um, you know, here on the West Coast, you immediately run into uh, the, the, the question of automotive use. Um, you know, in California, absolutely, cars are the largest contributor of greenhouse gases. And uh, we, I don't believe that it is actually possible for us to electrify a fleet as large as we currently run in this country, um, but that's my opinion. Uh, but certainly if we were to do that, it completely changes the question of how much clean energy we need to be generating, right? Um, my suspicion is that we will electrify some vehicles, but that we will also greatly reduce demand for vehicles and for vehicle miles traveled. And that that then really starts to get into this conflict between the ability to um, provide on-site or within district and the necessity to develop more densely. Um, and I suspect that we're going to start to just acknowledge that in this context, in the context of, of wider scales especially, um, it is not an important strategy to generate energy within the city. Um, that it's just so much, it, it makes so much more sense in the total energy picture to have the city be for, you know, walkability and, and, and use um, and to put the energy off site. But I do think that we're going to see, um, I do think that where net zero fits into that, especially sort of strict net zero on site, is that it does have this really wonderful effect of, of changing people's sense of what's possible. Um, and I think we, we, we maybe haven't even touched on that enough today, that I have seen people look at buildings, you know, like the Bullet Center, and suddenly you, you see them go, oh, wow, we could do this, right? We could actually run our society on clean energy. And so as 
if nothing else, as, as powerful demonstration projects, I think we're going to see more net zero buildings within the context of a carbon zero city. Um, and I think it's worth, you know, I think that power is, is really worth the power of the imagination, of changing people's sense of what's possible, is itself a worthy goal. Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, – does anyone um, uh, else want to kind of comment on, you know, what – how do we how do we inspire and engage? I think this is a good, good way to end this, uh, you know, to to see that, uh, you know, it's not a pipe dream, that it, that it really is possible. Yeah, I would I would echo Alex in that some of these exemplary projects are in fact you know opening people's eyes to uh, the fact that we can do it and also do it in a way that is beautiful uh, and adds a lot to uh, the surroundings. Um, I think that's one of the most in, important elements of getting this right. You know that these buildings have that lasting value that I spoke of uh, a little bit earlier. That would be something that I think is really important. And this is Brad. I, you know, I, so with Z Home, we had a, a period, an open house period where for two months we had kind of like a future living fair and we had 15,000 people come through Z Home, uh, you know, just regionally. You look at the Bullet Center and those numbers are, are even higher and there's an ongoing presence with, with the Bullet Center. And those are really, you know, those are just two signature projects in the Seattle area. And I think every area is, is we're going to start to see, have their kind of regional signature projects like that. And I, you know, just to leave this on a positive note, you know, I think with, you know, they, the, the issues of climate change and energy supply and all that stuff, it is daunting stuff. I mean, it's maybe not quite on the par with like being afraid of nuclear Armageddon, but it's like maybe a step or two below that. And the good news is, is, you know, we do have the technology now to deal with that. And it's just really a matter of uh, all of us, you know, mutually turning the dial on that. And, uh, the thing that I see is I think a lot of people, you know, climate change freaks out a lot of people because they think there's no answer. And I think the reality is that there are answers and they're right under our nose. So I think it's, to me, it's just like, okay, it's really time for this to scale. And, uh, and I do think net zero energy, you know, I think we've touched on, on a lot of the nuance, but, um, of you know where it maybe starts to fall off as an idea, but I do think it captures people's imagination. So we should ride that horse as long as it makes sense. I I would agree, and uh, I think that's a, a great note to end on. Um, Brad, Alex, and Jonathan, thank you so much for your you. uh, time and insights today. Really enjoyed the conversation, um, and thank and to our sponsor. Autodesk for sponsoring and for supporting the design-led revolution. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and, and will be available archived on our website at cleanedge.cleanedge.com. Uh, thanks to everyone who uh, joined us today, and uh, we will catch you next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.